Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome all and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jacob Frankel, the chairman of uh, the trustees of the group of 30. And let me first say on behalf of the group that I hope you are all well and we appreciate you joining us today. Despite the times, I'm delighted that the G30 is able to host a virtual event and bring our global community together to debate this vital and important topic. End of July, the Group of 30 released our most recent publication, Digital Currencies and Stablecoin, Risks, Opportunities and Challenges Ahead. The report is the culmination of efforts of the G30 Working Group on Digital Currency and Stablecoin, a group that was led by co-chairs Raghuram Rajan and Kenneth Rogoff, who I am very pleased to say are with us today. We thank all members of the steering committee and the working group who contributed their time and insights to the preparation of this report. For those of you who may not have received the digital copy of the report, please go to our website, group30.org, where you can download a copy uh, for free. The outstanding panel for today's discussion on digital currencies includes the two project co-chairs and one of the report's distinguished project advisors. Our distinguished panels today are Kenneth Rogoff, Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Ken is the author of The Curse of Cash and has been thinking about the digital transition for many years. Ken served as Chief Economist of the IMF from 2001 to 2003. Raghu Rajan, Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago at the Chicago Booth School of Business. Raghu, served as a distinguished governor of the Reserve Bank of India between 2013 and 2016. And previously, he was chief economist and head of research of the IMF. Daryl Duffy, he is a distinguished professor of management and finance at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Daryl publishes widely on finance and economics often being recognized as an expert, a special expert on the evolution of digital currencies. And Dell has, has be served as an advisor to the project. We thank our panelists for being here today and now turn to them for opening remarks and introduction to the webinar topic. We will first go to Ken Rogoff, Raghu and Daryl and we will then proceed with Q&A and there will be a brief intervention in between which I will announce as we go to there. So let me start with our panelists. First, Ken Rogoff, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jacob, and thank you to everyone who is here. Um, uh, also to my fellow panelists, uh, in addition to Raghu, I want to uh, especially recognize Daryl Duffy, who was a, uh, a very key project advisor, and Hyun Shin uh, at the BIS also played a very fundamental role. Uh, he's not able to be here. And I certainly uh, also want to welcome uh, Governor Yi from the People's uh, Bank of China. Uh, they made a very important contribution uh, to the paper as well, uh, which you'll, you'll hear about that uh, People's Bank of China uh, has really been very thoughtful and a leader uh, in the central bank digital currencies area. Um, they're, they're, uh, I, I should start out by saying that the body of the paper is kind of technical. Uh, we are really directing this at uh, an audience uh, who's working on the topic in the regulatory area, in the policy space, and it, it's a very technical area. And we try to provide uh, 
a, a roadmap to, th to thinking about it. And we hope that the paper uh, will prove useful. Um, our, uh, out of this, uh, we draw some conclusions. They're very, uh, you'll see, cautious and tentative because it's a very rapidly changing area. The first is that central banks, uh, in particular, really need to wake up to this. Uh, this train is leaving the station. It's left the station. The world uh, is on the cusp of a very major change. It's happening very quickly and it needs guidance. It's not uh, a foregone conclusion what direction it evolves. Uh, we sort of break up the report into maybe the private sector ideas, the private sector digital currencies of which there are many and the potential for central bank digital currencies. As far as the, the, the private uh, uh, digital currencies go, uh, we emphasize basic points such as it's important to have resilience, particularly as a private currency become, private digital payment mechanism becomes large. And one thing we underpin in the report and we talk about some of the literature is it often takes many, many years to develop resilience. You don't know, no matter how something looks on paper, it doesn't necessarily work that way in practice. Of course, we're seeing that with, uh, uh, you know, how, how we're trying to think about vaccines and the current pandemic and the uh, things that you can miss when it blows up into the whole system are uh, no different. And you want to maintain competition. And certainly the existing players have, we have to open up things up to competition if these new providers are having value added. And that can involve a lot of regulatory issues and also potentially access to the central bank balance sheets, which is a big advantage that the existing uh, players have. Before jumping into digi the digital, new digital uh, currencies and new digital ideas, there's a lot that can be done with the existing system. It's systems are very different across countries. United States uh, dramatically lags a lot of the world and things like real-time payments. Uh, uh, Governor Lael Brainerd has laid out uh, plans that the Federal Reserve has for catching up, but there's a lot that can be done with the current system. And, and I think you have to compare the new ideas to that alternative. I, I you don't know, you know, take a pick a horse in that, although I suspect the newer ideas will eventually uh, win out. Uh, another point is that if the central banks are going to introduce a digital retail currency, where, which hits ordinary consumers, not a wholesale one, which is just for big financial institutions, there is a lot to be aware of uh, in launching into this process. And I, actually, I think it's very interesting what the People's Bank of China lays out, a very gradual process, not to try to totally blow up the current system, there are many problems that people have long been aware of. For example, disintermediation. If you take away the source of funding of existing banks, it can produce uh, problems uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, there are issues for monetary policy. I won't talk about that here, but I have to mention privacy. This is obviously key. How do you regulate privacy? I can't summarize it here. But obviously, this is an absolutely uh, key question. I also have to mention uh, that we need an international platform. The gold standard here is to find something where there's interoperability, where different central banks and different countries, different players can tap in to a similar system. This, is, this may sound you know, very good, don't we all want this? Uh, actually, as you're well aware from looking at the digital divide, uh, looking at the dominance of the US and the current rails of the global financial system, it is a very contentious issue. In fact, sort of coming back to, you know, what are some of the driving forces here? There, the, the dollar dominates the world at the moment. And it's not just that it's used in transactions. The US dominates the, the payment system in many ways. And I think one of the motivations that's driving many countries to think about doing something different is precisely to have uh, other channels. Anyway, they're, they're just uh, very interesting topics. Thank you, uh, all of you, uh, for being here. 
Thank you. Um, um, uh, thank you, Ken. That was uh, a wonderful introduction. I'm going to push on some of the issues that uh, that Ken talked up about, especially uh, with the potential uh, that is available in retail central bank digital currencies, as well as the challenges that will come in rolling it out. Um, in a central bank digital currency, which is available at the retail level, you get many of the features associated with private cryptocurrencies. Uh, you have the potential for speeding up payment transactions. You can lower transaction costs tremendously. I remember in India, uh, one of the biggest problems is cash in and cash out. There are people who live on hills uh, 10 miles up from the nearest branch for them to get cash they have to walk down 10 miles and then walk back up 10 miles and they typically don't have uh, digital means of transactions credit cards etc uh, you can leapfrog all that with uh, with a central bank digital currency there's also much lower need for pre-funding uh, with a cbdc uh, if uh, if appropriately structured uh, so when you make payments you don't need to have settlement accounts uh, of large size uh, and of course, uh, there is data. Uh, there are data which are generated through these transactions and can be a tremendous source of additional value added. Uh, for instance, uh, private players can offer credit on that basis. Um, the uh, additional features of central bank digital currencies, if it was just uh, uh, replacing cash, uh, that would not be exciting uh, in its own right, but you can overlay a variety of structures on that. For example, you can have smart contracts overlaid on central bank digital currencies. You have the possibility, though Ken uh, uh, sort of uh, glossed over this, you have the possibility of paying negative interest rates, uh, something Ken has talked about earlier. Uh, and, and finally, uh, I think uh, when the central bank maintains the, dig the digital currency, uh, it has vast experience with fiat currencies and the, the maintenance of value of those. Uh, it is uh, the regulator. Uh, and so to some extent, uh, you know, the private sector can use that, uh, that uh, basis, the central bank digital currency, and in innovate on that uh, while leaving the value maintenance, uh, the regulation, et cetera, uh, to the central bank itself. There is a already built-in trust uh, if, uh, for example, we had a digital dollar uh, that the Fed would, uh, would, would run it appropriately. And finally, I think uh, uh, the value of a central bank digital currency is that you don't have a private monopoly instead, and uh, or you don't have uh, you know uh, a balkanized system with different private uh, players uh, occupying different uh, areas. Uh, you can fully realize the network externalities associated with a payment system because there is a common one. Now, some of these benefits also become challenges uh, for obvious reason that uh, um, uh, what happens with a central bank digital currency is that because it's a monopoly, the, uh, the question about whether it's safe and hack proof becomes uh, very important. This is a point that Ken made. Uh, you have to take a long time to figure out whether it, is, uh, it, it works. Uh, so one question is, how do you introduce it? At what point do you feel confident enough that you can, in fact, uh, run this at a large scale? And uh, a related question is, can you keep up with the innovation uh, in uh, currency technology, in, uh, in digital technologies, so as to continue keeping it safe? What is uh, proof uh, to um, you know, crypt cryptographic attack today may not continue to be uh, uh, you know, safe against it uh, if there are developments in cryptography. Now, you know, some people would argue this is not that big a concern. Uh, for example, many central banks print currency. Of course, uh, forgers learn how to replicate security features, but there are private players who continue uh, innovating security features, whether that kind of structure where the central bank sort of draws from private players to innovate on its central bank digital currency is something that is a question and certainly uh, the right kind of structure needs to evolve there. 
The second big issue with central banks uh, monopolizing digital currencies is how they deal with data. Uh, obviously, uh, privacy issues uh, become front and center. Uh, but also, uh, there is a question of how the central bank will share with the private sector in order to foster innovation. Because certainly, the private sector needs data uh, on transactions in order to provide uh, you know, new uh, products like credit-based products. Uh, and uh, for that, there has to be a process by which data are shared, and that is something that central banks need to think about. And of course, Ken has already talked about some of the concerns about displacing the private sector, the disintermediation that could take place. Uh, for example, obviously, it will displace a number of crypto alternatives. But also, if it displaces banks, if everybody prefers to have their money uh, for transaction purposes, not in a bank demand de deposit, but either in a central bank account or in, uh, in the central bank digital currency, there is a real question about uh, the provision of liquidity by banks, whether that function becomes uh, less important, but also bank funding. Uh, because li these liquid deposits uh, are a source of bank funding and whether the central bank displaces them. And of course, if the central bank uh, draws this funding away, how does it get it back into the system? Uh, how does it recirculate the deposits that it receives? Uh, how does it ensure that private lending is not, uh, is not attenuated? These are certainly concerns we have to pay attention to. In normal times, many of them can be alleviated if banks pay a small interest on liquid balances uh, rather than paying zero interest. And the central bank maintains a zero interest central bank digital currency. However, these concerns could be much larger in crisis times when the flight to safety uh, can trump uh, interest rate considerations. People want to take their money out. And when they have to just move their money into a digital currency, it's the digital run is essentially one click away, unlike the traditional model of a bank run where you need to stand in queue. Um, of course, for large wholesale depositors, which is what matters in many bank runs, they already have the possibility of digital runs so long as they stay within the banking system. They take the money from one bank to a safer bank. So maybe some of these concerns uh, are not as big as we think they are, but they certainly deserve a lot of consideration. Last and, and finally, uh, with central bank digital currencies is, of course, the cross-border concern. For small countries, there's a greater possibility that they could suffer dollarization. People prefer the digital currency, the US dollar or the renminbi, uh, rather than, than their own domestic currency. And there's also the possibility of capital flight, uh, which is enhanced uh, with these digital currencies. There is the huge issue of how private data will be handled cross-border. Uh, of course, if the authorities uh, lose sight of transactions because some other country has sight of those transactions, uh, this certainly uh, creates a, a loss of awareness within the country itself, uh, a difficulty in policing, the same problems that arise with private digital currencies. But there's also the possibility of cross-border blackmail, which uh, is a potential worry if uh, a foreign authority gains data on transactions domestically. Now, I've raised some of the big concerns there are. There are designs which can mitigate some of these concerns. For example, in the paper, we talk a lot about hybrid central bank digital currencies rather than direct central bank digital currencies. And there are rules which can be structured to mitigate some but not all of these currencies, uh, or not some, but not all of these concerns. And some of those rules will have to be designed cross-border. The bottom line is there's plenty of opportunity here, but central banks have to tread carefully. But as Ken said, there is no option. They do have to look at this more carefully and think about how they interact with uh, this whole area. Let me stop there and hand over to Daryl, who, along with Hyun Shin, have been extremely important in crafting this report. Thanks so much, Raghu, and, uh, and thanks, Ken, and, and uh, also Governor Frankel. Thanks so much for uh, the chance to speak with you. I want to build on what uh, Ken and Raghu have said um, about the, um, 
reasons for this G30 report and some of the policy trade-offs. I wanna build on that by indulging in some speculation about likely future scenarios uh, going forward from here. <clears throat> First, I really expect that private stable coins are going to stay on the fringe of payment systems in developed market economies, especially given the compliance issues. Uh, the official sector really has the upper hand here and they won't leave much space for digital currencies that interfere with their payment systems. But Libra really changed the conversation last year by heightening the perception that we can do much better. Central banks are really now feeling the social pressure to address the quality and cost of payment services. And as Ken alluded, among the largest developed market economies, the situation in the United States is among the worst. Most central banks are grappling with some tough trade-offs here, and they've already been discussed by, by Ken and Raghu. There's a real zeitgeist that it's time to bring payment system efficiency into the 21st century, but it's not clear to many central banks exactly how they should do that. Will they continue to improve their bank railed payment systems by bringing in better and faster payment systems and regulations designed to improve performance and competition in the banking sector? Or will they go for a CBDC or something in between? China's central bank, like Sweden's, is now testing a CBDC. We will hear from Governor Yi of the People's Bank of China shortly. What will other central banks do? The Bank of Canada, in what strikes me as a prudent choice, is getting a CBDC technology completely ready to deploy on short notice, just in case, just in case of two contingencies. One. Uh, what if paper cash starts to disappear, as has happened in Sweden? Or what about if Canada's payment system is invaded by some other digital currency? And Raghu mentioned uh, this threat, which is, um, I think, more important for smaller and more open economies. For now, most of the other central banks are watching carefully and developing their plans. They don't really yet know what the coming disruption in payments will do to their commercial banks for better or for worse. On top of payment system efficiency, central banks are also concerned about financial inclusion, monetary policy transmission, data security, and preventing illegal payments. Ken and Raghu both talked about this. Most central banks really don't want to own the operational side of these problems. And this is discussed in the G30 report. Because of that, I expect that most CBDCs that are eventually introduced will be intermediated somehow by the private sector, which will perhaps distribute the CBDC to users, provide the apps, and offer other payment services. Interoperability will therefore be crucial. Ken mentioned interoperability on the international front. I think interoperability on the domestic front is going to be the determining factor about whether CBDCs make a, an important contrib uh, contribution to payment system efficiency or not. Nobody wants to use a payment app for a CBDC if the vendor doesn't accept it or if their friend won't accept a payment because their friend has a mobile payment app with a different uh, software uh, standard. The biggest benefit of CBDC over normal bank rail payments is going to be interoperability and universal access. CBDCs intermediated in the private sector are going to go well or badly based on interoperability. So I'm going to turn it back uh, to Jacob. I'm, it's fascinating to see what's going to happen from here. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ken. Ken, thank you, Raghu, thank you, Daryl. You really gave a very good panoramic view of the report, of what it is there, there, what are the risks, what, are, what is the way forward, what are still the questions. And uh, we are now having a special treat. I'm very pleased to welcome 
uh, distinguished G30 member and governor of the People's Bank of China, Dr. Yi Gang, to this uh, webinar. He will provide uh, a brief remark on the People's Bank of China's central bank digital currency project and latest developments in this sphere. As you could note, all the three panelists, Ken, Raghu, and Daryl, have all referred to the important uh, work that is being done at the People's Bank of China. And so we are all, and I can tell you many hundreds of us that are on the line, we are all very eager to listen to Governor Ye. And I want to remind you also that the G30 report includes a special box that was provided from the People's Bank of China on this topic. And I thank Governor Yi for participating here. Mr. Governor, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rogoff, uh, Rajan, and uh, Professor Duffy. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to participate in this seminar. And also, I think uh, the uh, G30 uh, report on digital currency and the stablecoin it's a, a well-written paper. I learned a lot from it. Uh, let me report uh, the uh, recent uh, development in uh, CBDC in China. We call it uh, eCNY. Uh, uh, the uh, eCNY is a digital version of the MIMB, uh, i.e. it's a digital uh, fiat currency of China, which is a uh, value-based and a quasi and a full account-based hybrid legal tender with loosely coupled account linkage issued by People's Bank of China. And also, uh, it uh, sounds very complicated, but it's actually operated by the authorized operator, uh, including big commercial banks and also uh, big companies like uh, Alibaba and Tencent, the uh, payment service providers, and also uh, telecom uh, operators. Uh, as uh, the uh, professor uh, correctly pointed out, uh, our structure uh, of uh, eCNY is a two-tier uh, system, which is a hybrid uh, model. The uh, two-tier model uh, comprise of uh, People's Bank of China as a uh, one tier, and also commercial uh, institutions serving as operating agencies um, which uh, is uh, providing the uh, uh, retail service operating in China. The uh, two-tier model allow more uh, effective uh, usage of existing business resources, human resources, and also technology. Uh, it's promoting innovation and uh, promoting competition through the uh, market-driven uh, development without imposing any uh, pre-descriptive technology path in advance. Uh, so that, uh, that means that uh, you know that uh, companies such as Alibaba and Tencent, they are very creative. Our uh, big commercial bank also, they have all their own approach. Uh, our two-tier uh, system is that uh, People's Bank of China set the standard and uh, the, uh, uh, the requirement where we allow the uh, commercial institutions such as the commercial bank and also uh, the uh, giant uh, tech companies to have their own version of uh, uh, when they issue and uh, to do the uh, retail service for the uh, eCNY. Uh, they adopt um, this uh, hybrid model, uh, which is an intermediate solution uh, providing for the uh, direct claim on the central bank while uh, real-time payment are handled by the intermediaries, the general public could exchange eCNY from the authorized operator who could exchange the same amount of eCNY from the central bank. Consumer have a direct claim on the central bank. It is very similar to the current uh, uh, creditor-debtor relationship of uh, cash in circulation. So that's the uh, uh, idea of this uh, hybrid uh, uh, system. 
And also, um, as uh, uh, Professor um, pointed out, a very uh, important aspect, uh, that is the uh, uh, consideration of uh, personal data and the privacy. So how we handle the uh, an anonymous, whether we have an anonymous approach uh, or pseudo uh, limited approach. So in our approach is that we have, uh, uh, you see, consider this. On one hand, we have to uh, protect uh, personal data and uh, privacy. Uh, on the other hand, we also have to consider uh, KYC, know your customer, and also anti-money laundry and anti-terrorist finance and also uh, tax invasion problems. Uh, the approach is a balanced approach. Uh, we try to keep the uh, balance of uh, uh, protect personal data and the privacy. Uh, at the same time, uh, you see we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, supervision or pseudo anonymity uh, to handle this very delicate uh, uh, issue. Uh, that's uh, the, uh, we have uh, more or less a solution of this problem. And uh, uh, I think uh, the practice will suggest that uh, it's uh, uh, a continuous uh, process. The uh, EECNY is a digital version of renminbi and uh, EECNY is uh, legally the fiat currency, uh, same as the um, paper plastic coin version of renminbi providing direct claim on the central bank. Well, the uh, e-wallet of uh, Alipay and the uh, TenPay uh, are payment of uh, uh, infrastructures they provide. Uh, before the ECNY, the uh, uh, third payment uh, companies like uh, Alipay and TenPay, they are providing uh, e-wallet service with uh, commercial bank deposit money uh, with the issuance of ECNY, Alipay and Tenpay can also provide e-wallets service with the central bank money because uh, they are also uh, cho chosen as the uh, authorized operators of ECNY. In the era of ECNY, Alipay and Tenpay remain as uh, the uh, wallets or payment infrastructure uh, providers. Uh, in line with the uh, principle of uh, two-tiered system, uh, ECNY is a M0 substitute, which it's a, a substitute of cash. And also we have the controllable uh, anonymity. Uh, ECNY project uh, has complete uh, its uh, architecture and also technical uh, standard. Uh, we have uh, the system developed and also we have done the interoperability test. People's Bank of China will uh, cautiously select uh, appropriate uh, uh, use cases and uh, initiate a pilot program in several cities in China. Uh, right now in uh, four or five cities. With the progress of pilot run, uh, PBOC will continuously enhance the performance to prepare for the future introduction of ECNY. With uh, the uh, property characteristic and also loosely coupled account linkage, ECNY could provide functions that e-wallet cannot. Uh, such as uh, offline payment functions, and also such as uh, a smart contract, as uh, a professor just mentioned, uh, something like a conditional payment and a scheduled uh, payment. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Yi. This has been uh, as instructive as uh, characteristically we got used to expect from your remarks. So uh, with this, we finish the formal presentations by the panelists and by our guest uh, speaker. And we will turn now 
to a, a Q&A period. Um, I must say, there is no way I can pay and give justice to the numerous questions that came through in the mail and uh, during the past uh, two hours. But I'll try to group them in one way or another, and I'll throw them to the floor and the panelists will feel free to relate to them. And then we will then move from there. There are several questions that had to do with implications. Implications of wholesale central bank digital currency to liquidity demand and money markets. This was a remark by uh, Alastair Milen from uh, Loughborough University. There was a question about uh, what, the, to what degree will the central bank digital currency eliminate the opportunity of stablecoin becoming a medium of exchange. There was a similar question about the role of disintermediation that was mentioned by the panelists, and this was brought up by Moa Roy from the Reserve Bank of India. And then there was another question from the State Bank of India about psychology, namely, would individuals be psychologically indifferent to be spending digital currencies versus paper uh, currencies. So let me group them together under the title implications. Feel free to jump into this, relate to any aspect of it. And then there is another group of questions about risks and another group of questions about the future. So please feel free to pick and choose any one of them. I cannot uh, communicate directly with each one of the panelists. So show me by a little sign that you are willing to refer to it. I can see the head of Ragu moving. I do not know about the other. Okay, I can see Ken. Uh, please, go ahead. Uh, let's Ken, start go ahead, please. Uh, with Ken, please. Uh, yeah, I, I, I first want to pick, uh, emphasize a point that uh, Daryl Duffy made, and we don't explicitly say it in the report, but I, I, share, I share the view that uh, Sta stable coins you should think of as competing with uh, MasterCard and Visa, PayPal, other mechanisms for uh, their really, um, you know, apps that can be run with the central bank currency, but it's not going to replace central bank currency. And it's a, I would say a point I emphasized in my book from five years ago is this, when it comes to uh, currency, the central, the government makes the rules. And if they're not winning at first, they'll eventually win. They'll keep changing the rules till they win. And I, I think with stable coins, one issue that's, if they become really systemically important is that they are vulnerable to runs. I, anything you try to put in place that has a very similar feel and uh, structure to fixed exchange rates. And that's why I actually mentioned in passing in my initial remarks that probably, in, you know, eventually, if we want to keep them on a major scale, there'll have to be some access to the central bank balance sheet to prevent panics, but that's fine. That's something banks uh, have. And then I just want to pick up on the psychology point from the Central Bank of India, where, of course, uh, Raghur Jhan was the former, former governor. Uh, I, I do think that's a very interesting question, uh, although, you know, by and large with uh, younger people, I, I think they have, you know, they very, very freely are moving to digital uh, currency everywhere, digital payments mechanisms. So I, I, I suspect this is something of a generational thing uh, that over time it, it will become the norm. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Any one of the panelists that wants to jump in before I move to the next group, please. Sure. sure. Just on the, uh, again, a point that Daryl made, uh, you could imagine certain niche markets where the private digital currencies play. One uh, very important market uh, that may take time to cover by central bank digital currencies is the cross-border market. And you can imagine a private digital currency sort of uh, making the bridge between two currencies uh, or two areas. Uh, uh, and uh, that could be a niche market. There could be others. Uh, but I think broadly, uh, the digital currencies uh, 
themselves, uh, I think the majority of the space, once the central banks decide to enter, will be occupied uh, by the central banks. Um, and that, uh, I think the, the other question that you raised was a question of disintermediation. And I think here again, um, you know, there are ways around. Uh, this is a place where the, I, I believe the banks can still have a role. Uh, it is just a question of making their deposits more attractive than the central bank deposit. And that might be just a question of paying an appropriate rate of interest. Uh, the real question uh, arises in times of crisis. Uh, and uh, that is something we have to think through very carefully. Now, uh, some of it can be dealt with by limiting the size of the uh, transactions that are possible with the central bank digital currencies, something I understand uh, China is contemplating. But, uh, but we have to think through this a little more uh, to be confident. Thank you. Dale, please briefly. Yeah, I want to go to the question uh, from Alistair Milne uh, regarding wholesale central bank digital currencies. And he's interested in the uh, impact that these may have on bank revenue streams or market liquidity. In my view, uh, these wholesale CBDCs are not likely to be as revolutionary as the general purpose CBDCs that we've been focusing on most of the time. The wholesale ones are designed to facilitate uh, large value payments among uh, significant banks uh, for things like security settlement, and I think the introduction of these wholesale CBDCs, rather than disintermediating the banks, they'll actually be driven by the banks themselves to the extent that they want to improve uh, their, the existing efficiency and speed of uh, security settlement and large value uh, payment settlement. Uh, they'll they'll uh, push these forward or not. It'll be, it'll be driven more by them. They already have a effective central bank digital currency for that purpose, which is their deposits in the central bank. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, copacetic about uh, the impact of these. They've already been tested by the Bank of Canada and the Monetary Authority of Singapore in their Jasper and Ubin projects. And they've been found not to um, offer enormous uh, advantages, at least so far in testing. Uh, over the existing uh, uh, central bank payment systems that are available. So um, I'm not worried about this. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And this leads me to as a transition for to a one basic question, which is by uh, Nali Nukwon from the Bank of Thailand. Really a fundamental question. So why do central banks need central bank digital currency if existing platforms are already efficient. How do we respond to that question? Well, I'll just pick up uh, briefly on that and then uh, Raghu and Ken, I'm sure we'll have more to, to yes. add. I, I think the premise that existing um, payment arrangements are efficient varies a lot by country. And uh, Ken and I both mentioned the United States. I don't think this current uh, situation in the United States is satisfactory. Uh, so we shouldn't take it as a given uh, that it's unnecessary to do something. I'm not convinced that CBDC is necessarily the way to go, but I wouldn't accept the, the premise that uh, we're okay where we are, at least in the United States, where the cost of running the payment system is close to double what it is in uh, Europe and uh, Asia, and payments are pretty slow, and they're not accessible 24-7. Uh, so I think big improvements are possible, and uh, we should keep, <laughs> the G30 report discusses this at length. We should keep pushing in this direction. Thank you. Anyone else to on this? Because there are several more buckets of questions, please. Okay, I will move on. And if you want to say something about it, you can come back in the next subject, which is the risks. And there is here uh, several questions on the very same subject. The first one is from Cynthia Azevedo from the Banco Central do Brasil. And uh, what are the main risks for monetary policy of having CBDC and how do you tackle these risks? Related to it by uh, Michel uh, Wilsmer 
from the payment units of the Dutch Central Bank, how should regulators mitigate potential risk for financial stability that arise from CBDC? And another question about risks. Well, I think you have enough. I can see three more questions, but I will leave it alone if you want, for example, uh, um, let me leave it alone. There is an interesting question from the Bank of Lithuania, but I don't think that I can group them in this way. Uh, has there been, is the DLT sufficiently audited and tested to justify its superiority, superiority in security and resilience over the traditional deposit-based solutions? So I will leave it in hanging there. Risks, please. Yeah, let, let me just start. I mean, there, there are a host of risks, of course, when you do anything in the financial system. But in some sense, the mother of all risks here is something that blows up the system that you didn't think of. You take over uh, the payments mechanism with the new approach, and it had a vulnerability that you didn't think of, uh, and and uh, it, it creates it creates a huge risk. We're we've all we're all living with a biological virus, and I think you know, there's a big fear that the next virus could be a computer virus. And of course, if it hit at the payment system, uh, it would be the worst. Of course, one of the points of thinking these issues through is precisely that eventually the current system, which has proved very resilient, will not be resilient. And you need to think about how to upgrade it and how to improve it. But that absolutely is front and center. And I, I certainly one interesting technical point I learned over the course of working on this project, uh, coming out of the, uh, you know, uh, our, our colleagues in computer science, is uh, things may look resilient on paper, but you don't know. It takes a long time to see uh, where everyone tries to hack everything in every different which way. And I might add, you know, if we're, we're really thinking of changing the pay payment system, eventually quantum computing is coming and something that was resilient, isn't resilient, et cetera. So that, that certainly you know, should be absolutely front and center. You know, we have a system that can be improved. Uh, eventually, it will not be resilient. It will break down eventually if you don't upgrade it. We're looking for the next way to go. And that, that's part of this whole process that uh, the G30 report talks about. Thank you. Um, I want to be able to go to the chapter of the future. So unless somebody wants to say something very briefly. Well, very briefly, um, uh, I think the, um, it's, it's, I think Ken uh, and I uh, emphasize is it's not about just being satisfied now, it's being satisfied continuously into the future, which means there has to be a process of innovation uh, built into the currency that uh, you keep up with all the, um, uh, the threats to it. Now we do this with ordinary currency. We do change the security features over time to make it uh, less subject to forgery. But the question is, uh, is that pace adequate? And is the reliance on private parties for the innovation that keeps the uh, security features uh, updated is that enough or do you need a whole research establishment within the central bank, which is focused on crypto uh, or uh, cryptography and so on? And do they have the capacity right now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Agu. Uh, David, I know you were speaking so much about risks in your own work. I wonder if uh, you should jump in here or maybe we will move to the future. There will be enough risks item over there. Uh, well, I just want to, first of all, agree uh, with Ken and Raghu that the major risks are related to the operational side. Uh, there are some, some of the questions you mentioned, Jacob, uh, speak to risk to financial stability and monetary policy transmission. And I take it from that the questions are concerned about um, runs on banks or uh, whether interest rates uh, that the central bank sets uh, will be transmitted into the economy uh, less effectively with CBDCs. And I actually am not worried about either of these. I think the downsides on these are quite, are quite controlled. And in if anything, um, there are potential improvements 
uh, to be made um, uh, with CBDCs. I think the, the greater concerns are those that, that Ken and Raghu have raised. Thank you very much. And now we look into the future. Your crystal balls. First remark by Aminath Sima from the Maldives Monetary Authority. Will digital currencies become a norm? And if so, what is the timeline? Next one. What is a possible international framework to deter abusive use of digital currencies? Ken mentioned the aspect of this. Do we have set of standards and regulations that can deal with this? This was the previous question was by Aoyuki Toyama from the Sumitomo Mitsui Trust Bank. And this one was by Joss Milner from the Bank of Malawi. And uh, let me just conclude the future with two more questions that you will pick and choose if you want to refer to it. One by Toshiki Iwaokoa from the Institute for International Monetary Affairs. And that's a tough one. Can competitions for development of CBDC lead to a further divide in the global economy or society? And finally, a question about developing countries by uh, Soil Javad Syed from the State Bank of Pakistan. Namely, what are the main factors that developing countries should be looking at as they consider this subject? So you have many issues that are in the air, pick and choose, and we have to conclude within three to four minutes. And that's why I uh, uh, throw them all to you in what inter, please. Where right. you have I just say something yeah. very quickly, which hey. is, I mean, I, I think, uh, paper currencies being used less and less frequently in legal tax compliant transactions. There is a swarm of evidence about that. It's overwhelming. And there may be some uh, central banks pushing back on that fact, but you just have to look at the digital payments data and it's overwhelming, uh, more and more payments, smaller and small, smaller payments. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, quite natural that central banks uh, should look to rethink uh, paper currency as the People's Bank of China is doing. Thank you very much. Next one, Raghu. Uh, I think there are lots of issues here, uh, of course. Uh, you know, uh, data, uh, what kind of transactions will be allowed, um, um, who, who, I mean, right now, for example, you don't have a lot of control if the US dollar is used for drug transactions in Bolivia uh, or some other country, I don't. Uh, and and the, the question is once you have a digital dollar, uh, what are you gonna do about that? Who are you gonna share the data with? Uh, are you gonna allow these transactions? If you do have knowledge that this is being used for specific purposes, uh, a whole set of issues come uh, and you know, to what extent do, Users in other countries have uh, have privacy uh, relative to the uh, authorities in a different country. I mean, these are all uh, important questions. Uh, can and um, uh, so so I think they, we need frameworks for these. Uh, for developing countries, I think uh, there is the uh, very strong concern that if you don't have uh, reasonable currency management. Uh, you face a greater threat of dollarization uh, of people using a different currency simply because it is much more accessible than, say, paper currency. Of course, the usual processes by which you get that currency will still matter. And, and finally, I, I think we may see competition for development of CBDCs, especially if uh, they have a much bigger uh, uh, sort of playing ground than your own, own country. Uh, but I hope that uh, that we get discussion between the major central banks on how to deal with some of these cross-border issues uh, before we get that competition. Thank you very much, Raghu. Daryl, you have the floor. Yeah, well, I, the questions you've raised, Jacob, I think are perfect for uh, international forums like uh, the Committee for Payments and Market Infrastructure, CPMI, and IOSCO. 
uh, the, uh, these questions are crucial and uh, they've, they've been present already, um, but, but CBDC ups the ante uh, and the entrance of private digital currencies ups the ante on the importance of addressing these questions in an international forum to which um, all central, all in, uh, contributing central banks uh, participate because the standard setting and the protection of, on protection of data, on interoperability uh, technologies, uh, these are perfect questions uh, for them. And the, the banks that are moving ahead, uh, like China, for example, uh, will have a seat at the table that um, uh, gives them an opportunity to explain what they're doing and how their technology uh, uh, can interact with technologies being developed at, uh, at other central banks. So I think there, there is a scope here for actually healthy competition among central banks on the technology side. And uh, 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 the, these international forums are a great uh, venue uh, for those discussions to take place. Thank you very much, Dale. I must say, you said the questions that I was asking. I transmitted the questions that our audience has been asking after a lot of uh, curtailing. I can tell you that the interest of our audience, as reflected by the number of questions and the geographic distribution, only uh, testifies to the relevance of the subject, to the appropriateness of uh, this report, and to the fact that it is a program that we are still on the road. We are, it's not a destination. There is still a lot of work to be done and some of these questions can create indeed the work program for us and for others. So with this, we have reached the end of our time together. And uh, while we cannot hear how everyone is clapping, please join me in uh, acknowledging the contributions of our panelists. And let me use the last few seconds to give you a little bit of an update uh, about uh, the work of the G30s that is now being uh, uh, completed. Uh, the first project that is going to be released very soon is mainstreaming the transmission to a net zero economy. This is an intervention on climate change and finance, which is chaired by uh, Mark uh, Carney and Janet Yellen. We will release it on in October 8th, just around the corner. Please save the date and invitations will be sent to the launch of this event uh, very soon. The second project is about corporate sector revitalization post COVID-19. Wow, we must be very optimistic to worry about the post COVID-19, I think that we are going to live with COVID for a long time. But this project is being led by, again, Raghu Rajan, and this time together with Mario Draghi, which will be, we will be publishing it hopefully in Q4 of this year. Please stay tuned to it. And the third project, which is in the works, is uh, Emerging Markets and Sovereign Debt Restructuring, this is a report that is co-chaired by Larry Summers and Guillermo Ortiz with important recommendations that are uh, uh, in the works uh, which will be released within the coming few months. As you can see, the G30, while we have been locked down, uh, it still remains uh, productive, still focus on the systemic questions and the challenges. Please stay tuned. We hope that you all stay well keep healthy, and we are wishing you all the very best. Thank you very much, my dear colleagues, and our time is up. Goodbye. Thank you.